Hi, this is a revision video for GCSE English Literature. We're looking at Animal Farm by George Orwell, and this video gives an overview of Chapter 4. By overview, I mean a summary of events, a look at the key characters, some analysis of important quotations. Um, if you just need an overview of the chapter, I cover that first. So let's move over here to give a summary of events. Now, you could say this is an outward facing chapter, at least at the start, because we learn about events outside of the farm. This chapter is also dominated by events that show the relationship between humans and animals. So key events, news of Animal Farm has spread. We learn about Mr. Jones and his relationship with Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick. There are links to European history here, which I cover later in the video. Jones returns to attempt to reclaim the farm. A bloody battle takes place, named the Battle of the Cowshed. Molly goes missing, and military decorations are issued. Now we'll move over here to examine the setting. The second half of this chapter is set on Animal Farm, as the Battle of the Cowshed takes place there. But the opening tells us of news from elsewhere. We learn that Snowball and Napoleon sent out flights of pigeons to mingle with the animals on neighbouring farms tell them the story of the rebellion and teach them the tune of, Beast of uh, Beasts of England. And here we see the propaganda machine in action and this mirrors Trotsky's attempts to spread the message of communism across the world. Trotsky believed that the future of communism depended on it becoming an international movement. We are also told of Mr Jones sitting in the tap room of the Red Lion at Willingdon. That's a very traditional name for a pub, probably one of the most common names of British pubs. And a tap room is the main bar where the alcohol is served literally on tap and of course Jones is complaining to anyone about the rebellion. We hear of the two farms Pinchfield and Foxwood and their respective owners Frederick and Pilkington. Mr Frederick represents Ad Adolf Hitler and Mr Pilkington represents Winston Churchill of Britain. Now Pinchfield is the Pinchfield the farm is, is Germany and it's described as better kept than Foxwood. Later in the novel, Frederick betrays the pigs, just as Hitler invaded Russia following the signing of the Non-Aggression Pact. We'll cover this in more detail in a video on chapter 8. So Foxwood, representing Britain, is large, neglected and old-fashioned, and Pilkington is described as spending most of his time fishing or hunting. Orwell and Churchill came from very different ends of the political spectrum, and Churchill was from an old aristocratic family, so perhaps Orwell is showing him in this light here, as being rather detached from the needs of his country. However, Churchill is widely regarded as being a successful leader during the war era, and spent much of the 1930s giving warnings about Hitler. In Animal Farm, Pilkington and Frederick are unable to get on, which mirrors the reality of European history. We also learn that both Frederick and Pilkington were both equal, uh, thoroughly frightened sorry, by the events of Animal Farm and punished animals on their farms who were caught singing Beasts of England. Now, it's the pigeons who bring news of Jones returning with his men. And some literature analysts place this as the October Revolution of 1917. Remember, there were two revolutions that year in Russia, the first overthrew the Tsar and the second uh, place the Bolsheviks in power. Whereas others see that this battle represents infighting in Russia in the years shortly after 1917. The Bolsheviks, who were known as the Red Army, fought with the White Guard, who were loyal to the Tsar and fiercely anti-communist. Remember, don't fixate on the specifics of the allegory. Orwell was a phenomenally intelligent man and writer and nothing is straightforward. And he saw politics and history as complex and it's possible he was making a comment on multiple events. So Jones returns and the battle commences and we should pause here to think about what we learnt in chapter 3 that the animals didn't really have the same level of understanding as the pigs. They didn't really develop the ability to read and write and the pigs held the knowledge and therefore the power. In this battle, although the animals fought fiercely and courageously, they didn't really understand the cause and also the reader understands perfectly that the animals are fighting for the pig's privilege and for their own continued oppression at the hands of the pigs. So Snowball gives a, fear, a, a squeal, which is the signal for retreat, and the animals run back into the farm. Of course, this is a trap. The men chase the animals into the farm, whereupon the animals ambush the men. And Orwell's language here is really pacey and dramatic. 
I'll put some quotations up for you. So we've got the pellet scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back. A sheep dropped dead. Jones was hurled into a pile of dung and his gun flew out of his hands. The most terrifying spectacle of all was Boxer. Um, and a note here if you're reading the chapter as I go through this, ignominious means shameful. Now Orwell departs here from his usual simple clear language. It's dramatic and emotive and this style is usually reserved for the rhetoric of the pigs. So you might want to go through those quotations and, and look at some of that language. Bloody streaks, drop dead, hurled, the gun flew out of his hands and a terrifying spectacle. All of that um, shows just quite how dramatic and serious and sort of violent this battle was that's reflected in that language. I'm just going to move down here to look at Boxer's language. He is dead, said Boxer sorrowfully. I had no intention of doing that. And we've also got Boxer saying, I have no wish to take life, not even human life. And perhaps we need to reflect on whether, although the animals were really keen for revolution, did they understand the reality of what that meant? Now we can contrast Boxer's language with Snowball's. Snowball says, war is war. The only good human being is a dead one. And here we see the reinforcement of the deep divisions between the pigs and the other animals and the notion that the pigs are very much like humans in attitude. They're ruthless and hard-hearted. We know that this only further develops through the novel and it also reflects the attitude of the Bolsheviks that communism should be achieved at any cost. Now, Lenin and Trotsky were willing to use violence and terror to achieve the aims of the Russian Revolution. This is known as revolutionary terror. Latsis, a leader of the Soviet police, if you like, once wrote, we are engaged in exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. And also Trotsky wrote, the historical tenacity of the bourgeoisie is colossal. We are forced to tear off this class and chop it away. And tenacity means, you know, they really stick. They're, they're really difficult to remove. So both of these um, leaders sort of take a quite a violent approach to the revolution and, and that's definitely achieved, that's definitely shown in, in Orwell's novel. Um, so Orwell aptly demonstrates that the idea that revolution is not peaceful, it is and was a bloody and violent movement. People died, people were willing to kill to achieve their aims and the pigs are the animals whose ideas about this most closely reflects human views. Let's just go over here to look at the military decorations Oh, I've still got a cat there. Never mind. Um, now, there's something to be said here about military decorations. Remember, at the start of the novel, we learnt that all animals are equal. However, Snowball is given a military decoration. If you're not sure what that is, it's like an award for excellent service. It usually comes with a medal to many countries. Armies have these. And when it comes to Animal Farm, we need to think carefully about the message that's being given here. Are all animals equal if some are being given special attention? We know that many animals fought bravely, so why is Snowball decorated when others are not? The principles of animalism are being compromised here. Now, just before this, we learned that Molly, she's the white mare, she has disappeared. And remember that she represents the petty bourgeoisie, that's the lower middle classes, who had quite a comfortable life and didn't like the sound of communism. Many of them fled Russia a few years before. Um, sorry, a few years after the Ru Russian Revolution. And so we've learnt that by chapter four, she's had enough and she's going. I think we'll leave it there. That's a summary of chapter four for you. I'll post chapter five shortly. Thank you so much for watching.